Welcome back to our next episode of What's Up Prof. Hello Walter. We're back again. Yes. And I'm excited for this discussion. Okay. Will you open up for us? Yes, let's okay. do that. Heavenly Father, as we are going to discuss the central issue of the plan of salvation, I pray that you will be with us with your spirit. Lord, this is such an important topic. And I pray that you will enlighten our minds, that you may become more and we may become less. In Jesus' name, Amen. amen. Yes, so last time we got to the salvation issue of the atonement. And can you briefly give us an introduction or a recap of what we've been doing in the, in the past two lectures? Yes, we were discussing Babylon and the doctrine of the serpent. And uh, our introductory text was Genesis chapter 3 verse 1 where the serpent said unto the woman, has God said? And then we looked at the three lies or distortions that the devil brought into the world. And the first one, as you will remember, was about the immortality. You will surely not die. And then we looked at the second one, ye shall be as gods. And the third one was you will be able to distinguish between good and evil. Yes. And then we, we went through the documentation and we saw that Rome preaches as doctrine all three of the serpent statements. Yes. All three of them. So in other words, it's not what God said, it's what the serpent said that is central. But there's this one issue that is not exactly uh, emphasized here, which is very, very important. And that was the statement where after the fall of man, the promise was given of the Messiah that would come. Remember, it said, And I will put enmity between thee and the woman, and between thy seed and her seed, and it shall bruise thy head, and thou shalt bruise his heel. This was this great messianic promise that the Messiah would come and would crush the serpent's head. Remember we discussed how in the Douay Rhymes Bible, the Roman Catholic Church, via the Jesuits, changed it so that it became feminine. Yes. And uh, they say it is a reference to Mary, but it could just as well be a reference to the church. church yes. yes, so the church will actually achieve this. Because everything they say is based on what the church says and not on what God says. As, we, as we've seen. So this enmity between thee and the woman and the seed of the serpent and the seed of Christ's bride would continue until the close of probation. So this would be a theme that runs through the entire history. And this war will continue until the second coming. Mm. And also in that lecture, we had this slide, which said, did God really say that there was only one way by which atonement could be secured? And you remember in Genesis chapter 4, verse 4, we read an Abel, he also brought of the firstlings of his flock, and of the fat thereof. And the Lord had respect unto Abel and unto his offering. But unto Cain and to his offering he had not respect, and Cain was very wroth, and his countenance fell. Now, here are two ways of atonement that are described here. The one was the way of Abel, which was to bring the offering of the Lamb, which foreshadowed the coming of Christ. Mm. And the other offering was the offerings of the works of his own hands. And the fact that Cain was very wroth when his offering wasn't accepted, that is part of human nature. 
you want to be able to do this yourself. Why should you be totally dependent? Yes. And this is such an important issue. So there was a question also on the offering that Cain brought. Um, he was a, not a livestock farmer. So why was his offering not acceptable? Well, God had prescribed the way in which this had to take place. And it, it wasn't something that was introduced at the time of Cain and Abel. It was introduced at the time of the fall of Adam and Eve. Yeah. Because they had to sacrifice a lamb or a sheep. They had to sacrifice it because that was the typology. And just like the Jews had to bring a lamb and sacrifice it, and then the priest took over, so Adam and Eve had to slaughter that creature, that animal. And the blood that flowed was a type of the blood of Christ that would flow in their behalf. So what about the, the, the portion in the Bible that says God made the garments for Adam and Eve? Correct. So what was Adam and Eve's contribution? They had to bring the offering, they had to kill the offering, and God made the garments. He provided a type of the robe of righteousness that he would present. Now some people think that uh, God actually made the first sacrifice there. Adam and Eve had to sacrifice it because if you look further on, as it was prescribed to the Jews, if you were a, a sinner and you brought a, a sacrificial animal, you were the one that had to cut the throat. You were the one that had to initiate the action because you were responsible for the death of the lamb. That's very interesting. Beautiful. So here we see that Cain's offering was not accepted. Now if it was prescribed and you had to bring a lamb, then he should have bartered with his vegetables for the lamb. But probably, you know, they were farmers, they had all of these things, so he could have brought a lamb. He wasn't uh, only concentrating on one issue. In those days, they didn't have monoculture. Mm. They had all kinds of foods that they were working with. And the animals were part and parcel of farm existence and life, and they were used for, for work. So Abel brought the offering that was acceptable. Cain brought the offering that was not acceptable. And this conflict has been raging since the beginning of time. And the antitypical Cains of today are still very wroth and their countenance has fallen. They will not accept that you can be saved by the blood of the Lamb alone. That's why this atonement issue is so important. Mm. Yes. Now, when we looked at the previous one and we looked at the three issues that the serpent mentioned before Adam and Eve fell, that you will surely not die, that you shall be like God, and that you will be able in your own power to determine between right and wrong. Yeah. You don't need God for that. Then we saw in our discussion that that is exactly what the Roman Church teaches, mm -hmm. the three lies of Eden. Now in terms of the atonement, which one of the two methods, to be consistent now, do you think that they accept? They as will their have to doctor? accept Cain's method. Cain's method. In fact, they call Abel's method an anathema. An anathema. You are cursed if you follow Abel's method. So we need to go into a little bit of detail concerning this issue because this is the heart of the gospel. And then, when you put the package together, you will see that the one is biblical and is the way that God prescribed, and the other one is the way of Cain 
and is the exact opposite of what God prescribed. The devil is the master of reversal. Mm -hmm. He turns everything upside down. So and let's. If, and if you're, if you are then part of the side, and you can realize that you're part of the side that is believing Cain's and all the three lies of the devil, then you know you're part of Babylon. Yes, and even if you uh, have aspects of it, then you're partly Babylonian. Mm. But once you accept the authority of the one that is completely Babylonian, then you become part of Babylon. So, let's have a look at the atonement. Yes. Isaiah chapter 53 verse 12. Therefore will I divide him a portion with the great, and he shall divide the spoil with the strong, because he has poured out his soul unto death, and he was numbered with the transgressors, and he bare the sin of many, and made intercession for the transgressors. And the scripture was fulfilled which says, and he was numbered with the transgressors. What a beautiful verse in Isaiah pointing to Jesus Christ, who bore the sins of many and made intercession for the transgressor. This is the plan of salvation. In Romans 3 verse 25 we read, whom God has set forth to be a propitiation, a mercy seat as it were, a hilasterion through faith in his blood, to declare his righteousness for the remission of sins that are past, through the forbearance of God, to declare, I say at this time, his righteousness, that he might be just and the justifier of him which believeth in Jesus. Where is boasting then it is excluded? By what law? Of works? No, but by the law of faith. So the Bible clearly teaches that we are saved by faith through the blood of the Lamb. Mm. We have no righteousness of our own. Righteousness is imputed and imparted through Jesus yes. Christ. This is the biblical teaching. And we are saved through his blood. In other words, Jesus died for me. Because the life is in the blood, right? Yes. Rome denies that. Rome says Jesus never died for you. He died. But he didn't die for you. He died as a, an act of perfect obedience. And because of his perfect obedience and righteousness, God forgives you. But he didn't do it for you. So in Catholic theology, you have to work off your sins. You have to do the penance. You have to pay the price. Now when your sins are forgiven, then you still haven't paid the price for those sins. So in Catholic theology, when you go to heaven, you can't go to heaven yeah. because you haven't paid the price for your sins yet. So you must go to purgatory and there you pay the price for the sins. And depending on how much your sins was, it depends on your time in purgatory. Correct. That's Catholic theology. In biblical theology, Jesus Christ paid the price. According to Isaiah, he paid the price. And it is through his blood that I am saved. And his righteousness mm. is his imputed righteousness. and imparted to me. This is the biblical position. So let's have a look at the Lutheran Confession. And uh, this states, The gospel, however, is that doctrine which teaches what a man should believe in order to obtain forgiveness of sins from God. Since man has failed to keep the law of God and has transgressed it, his corrupted natures, thoughts, words and deeds war against the law, and he is therefore subject to the wrath of God. All have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. Yes. The wages of sin is? Death. Death. And deeds war against the law, and he is therefore subject to the wrath of God to death, to temporal miseries, and to the punishment of hellfire. 
The content of the gospel is this, that the Son of God, Christ our Lord himself, assumed and bore the curse of the law, which is death, yeah. and expiated and paid for all of our sins that through him alone we re-enter the good graces of God, obtain forgiveness of sins, through faith are freed from death and all the punishment of sin and are saved eternally. So there's no purgatory here, because there's no purgatory in the Bible, it is a Catholic invention. Okay, in actual fact it's a Greek philosophy. Now the wrath of God. This comes from manuscript releases. This is an Adventist source. God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son that whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have everlasting life. John 3.16 These words show us why God's wrath descended on his only begotten Son. Why the innocent suffered for the guilty. Why the just bore the punishment wholly due to the unjust. Jesus came to bear the penalty of man's transgressions to uphold and vindicate the immutability of the law of God and the rectitude of his government. He came to make an end of sin and to bring in everlasting righteousness. This is totally biblical. Mm -hmm. So why did Jesus have to die? Well, because the law of God could not be taken away. Yes. Because the Bible says where there is no law, there is no transgression. If there is no transgression, then there is no penalty. So the fact that he died meant that the law could not have been taken away. And all the reformers recognized this. And they make it quite plain that the fact that Jesus died means that the law stands. Wesley said it. Martin Luther said it. They all said it. Mm -hmm. Why does modern Protestantism say that the death of Christ does away with the law? If he could have taken the law away, then he would not have had to have die. You could have just stated. Exactly. So modern Protestantism is also marching in the paths of Babylon. Yes. Because if you take the law away, you take away the government of God. If you've taken away the government of God, what government have you put in its place? The government of man. The government of man. Which law are they keeping? Are they keeping the Sunday or are they keeping the Saturday? So which law are they keeping? They're keeping the law of the Pope. Yes, of Babylon. So that's a Babylonian teaching. Mm -hmm. It's a Babylonian teaching. It's sun worship. So, to put it bluntly, you are part of Babylon if you adhere to these teachings. Uh, there's, a little, there's a little rider in the Bible which says, if you know and you do it not, then it be for your sin. But there's another verse which says the time of ignorance God winks, winks at. at. So nobody is responsible until they are confronted with truth, convicted of truth and reject the mm. truth. But the world is moving in the direction of Babylonian teaching, including the Protestants. Yes. Now Catholics deny that God poured out his wrath on the sun. And some of their theologians, or at least those from the Jesus Institute, say, well, if this is the case, then you should love the Son, but hate the Father. Mm. I've heard that. Have you heard that statement? Yes. What kind of father would, would do, that. do that to his son? But you see, they don't understand the deity because Jesus says, I am the Father or one. Mm -hmm. So the entire Godhood was involved. And why was it Jesus that had to die? Because in Adam all have sinned. I inherited Adam's fallen nature. In who was Adam before Adam sinned? In Christ. He was in Christ. So all of humanity in its unfallen state was in Christ before it was in Adam. Because he's the creator. Mm. Therefore only God, only the creator could pay this price. Therefore, like Martin Luther, I want to reiterate and I stand with him. The God who didn't die for me is not my God. Because mm. nobody else could die for me. Because the Bible clearly says that I may not inherit your sins and you may not inherit my sins. I must be responsible for my own sins. So only 
God, in whom all humanity was cooperatively, could die for my sins. But what does he require of me? I once had an interesting discussion. It was years back. And he was a lawyer. And he knew I was a Christian. And I was dealing with property. I was buying a property and he was the lawyer. And we started talking. And one day he said, uh, please close the door. I said, sure. And he says, do you mind if I ask you a personal question? I said, no, I don't mind at all. He says, you're a Christian and you preach. And I said, yes. And he said to me, uh, I want to be a Christian, but I can't. And I said, why not? He says, I'm a lawyer. And it's not, it's not reasonable that Christ should die and pay the price for the sinner. Because if I'm in a court of law, and there is a guilty person who is a murderer and a rapist or whatever crime he committed, and somebody else stands up and says, I will die in his place. That is an act of mercy, but it's not justice. Justice demands that the sinner, the guilty party, pay the price. So Christianity doesn't work. So I, I say to him, but there's a flaw in your thinking. You see, Protestantism teaches forgiveness and no consequence. And that's what we read in Moody's writings in the last lecture. Do you remember? That Protestantism had given up its moral compass and had not allowed the Bible to teach them that it's not enough to have Jesus as your savior. You must be fully obedient. You must come back into harmony with obedience. So I said, you are right, except for one thing that the Bible clearly teaches that if you are in Christ, you must die in Christ. So I die in Christ and I am resurrected in Christ. So it requires a new birth. It requires the death of the old man and the resurrection of the new man who will allow God to work in his life. So who pays the price? Jesus pays the price cooperatively for all of humanity because he had humanity in him. Mm. But I have to pay the price too. I have to die. And once I have accepted Jesus as my savior, I must die to self and I must be resurrected in him. That is the new birth. And without it, I cannot see heaven. I am a new man. My own mother doesn't recognize me from what I was before. If I was a drunkard, I'm sober. Mm. If I was a glutton, I'm no longer a glutton, etc. There must be a change. If I lived in disharmony with God's requirements, I must now live in harmony with God's requirements. So Christianity without consequence is not true Christianity. Mm. So the wrath of God descended on his son. He paid the price for me corporatively as the corporate man, the God man, the only one who was fully human and yet fully divine. And that requires that I have to come back into harmony with his law and the rectitude of his government. He's my king as well. So here's the cornerstone of Christian doctrine, Romans 5. For when we were yet without strength in due time, Christ died for the ungodly. For scarcely for a righteous man will one die, yet peradventure for a good man some would even dare to die. But God commendeth his love towards us in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. It is clear in scripture that Jesus Christ died for us. Much more than being justified by his blood, that means by his death, we shall be saved from wrath through him. So he is the one who took the wrath of God. This is what the scripture teaches. 
For if when we were enemies we were reconciled to God by the death of His Son, is the scripture clear on this? Yes. Much more being reconciled, we shall be saved by His life. And not only so, but we also join God through our Lord Jesus Christ, by whom we have now received the atonement, the atonement. We are one with God again. He paid the price for me. He being divine and all humanity being in him, he paid the price. He died not only for me, he died as me and he died as you. He died for everyone, he paid the price. The wages of sin is death. And because he had no sin, as a human, no sin, he rose from the dead. And divinity took humanity with it and rose from the dead. And now, by accepting by faith his sacrifice on my behalf and repenting and allowing the old man to die in him, I can have eternal life being resurrected in him. It is no longer I but live, but Christ who lives in me. It's a beautiful doctrine. It is a logical doctrine. It satisfies the requirements of justice mm -hmm. and it satisfies the requirements of mercy. Beautiful. Yes. Now the Roman Catholic view of the atonement at the Council of Trent, the declaration of which are still in force, the Roman Catholic Church formally condemned the biblical doctrine of faith alone. Consider the following. If anyone says that justifying faith is nothing else than confidence in divine mercy, which remits sins for Christ's sake, or that it is the confidence alone, this confidence alone that justifies us, let him be an anathema, let him be cursed. The Bible says you are saved by faith alone. Mm. They curse you. Yes. If anyone says that the justice received is not preserved and also not increased before God through good works, but that those works are merely the fruits and the signs of justification obtained, but not the cause of its increase, let him be an anathema. Sure. Is this biblical? No. No. So are they an institution that has the Bible as its source? No. No, they deny the Bible. We just read the verses. Yes. Now let's see whether in practice this is really so. So what are they really saying? They're saying that Jesus never died for you. He died as an act of perfect obedience, but not for you. You still have to pay the price for your own sins. Mm. So what was he? He was just a nice example. So we can also be like that if we can do it by our own works, right? Sounds, then we yeah. become Christ's. Yes, that's what they That's teach. New Age teaching. Mm -hmm. Alan Jones, he's the Reverend of Grace Cathedral in San Francisco, wrote a book called Reimagining Christianity. And in this he wrote, The church's fixation on the death of Jesus as the universal saving act must end. And the place of the cross must be reimagined in Christian faith. Why? Because of the cult of suffering and the vindictive God behind it. How can God be vindictive if when he takes upon himself the penalty that is due to me? It is an act of unbelievable love. And they say it is vindictive. So this merely means that they have an image of God, the wrathful Father, and the separate being, the Son, who has to bear the wrath, because the Father is not willing to bear it. Exactly. But there's one God, and Jesus being fully God and one with the Father, the Godhood was involved in that cross sacrifice in its totality. It goes so far as to say, of the atonement, Jones also says, Jesus' sacrifice was to appease an angry God. You can only say something like that 
if you don't believe that Jesus was fully God or that he perhaps only had an imputed Godhood. He was fully man and he was fully God. He was, according to the scripture, the creator God. He's the one who spoke. In the beginning was the Word and the Word was with God and the Word was God. He's the one who spoke humanity into existence. Without him was not anything created. So we believe in a personal God. A personal God through whom we have access through Jesus Christ, who is a person, but one with the Father. So penal substitution was the name of what he calls this vile doctrine. So the fact that the Bible teaches that God took upon himself in Jesus Christ, the penalty for my sin is a vile doctrine, the Bible calls it the gospel, which means good news. And they call it vile news. This is a serious issue. Here's another one. Richard Lennon is a Sydney-based Jesuit priest, who is also the director of the Australian Catholic Film Office. Obviously, they like Jesuit theatre, right? And he states on the atonement, in a radio interview, most of the radio interview titled What to Say to Suffering and Death was interesting, but I found Richard's comments on atonement particularly so. In the top ten hymns of, for Christians right throughout the world, I think How Great Thou Art gets into the top five almost every time. And indeed, I love How Great Thou Art. We sang it at Mass only just recently, and I gave it out with gusto, with great gusto, but I can't sing verse 3. I wander through glades in verse 1, and I shout with acclamation in verse 5, but verse 3 says, And when I think that God, his son not sparing, sent him to die, I scarce can take it in. What a beautiful verse. Mm. Well, I can scarce take it in too, because I don't believe that sort of theology. It comes at a particular moment in Catholic theology called atonement theory. It's not a theory. From the 11th century and is based on Paul's letter to the Romans. So it's got some New Testament roots. Just look how they brush aside scripture. But when you unpack those parts in the New Testament, they are used in a very particular way that I think have lost their meaning now about buying back slaves and the whole process of redemption. And then it gets picked up about atonement, and then the Protestant reformers really perfect it in what is called satisfaction theology. That's the only way for God to get happy with the world, was the perfect son to make the perfect sacrifice so God's anger would be satisfied. No, God's justice. The wages of sin is death. The only way to solve the problem, to be still a just God, is to bear the penalty himself. How can they distort this in this fashion? There's another way that you can get into why Jesus died, and that is why was Jesus killed? You see, he didn't die for you. Yeah. And I say in the book that maybe it's just more helpful now to say that Jesus didn't come primarily to die, he came to live. Mm. But what does the Bible say? in whom we have redemption through his blood, even the forgiveness of sins. Colossians 1.14. Jesus died for me, right? Colossians 1.20. And having made peace through the blood of his cross by him to reconcile all things unto himself, by him I say, whether they be things on earth or things in heaven. And you that were sometimes alienated and enemies in your mind by wicked works, yet now has he reconciled in the body of his flesh through death to present you holy and unblameable and unreprovable in his sight through his righteousness. And almost all things, says Hebrew 9.22, are by the, law, by the law purged with blood and without the shedding of blood, no remission. Is the Bible clear? Yes. So anybody who believes that Jesus didn't die for you on the cross, that includes Islam. Mm. They deny the atonement. 
That includes Mormonism. Mormonism denies the atonement. That's rather sad. Mm. This is the essence of Christianity. Yes. There's a beautiful hymn that was penned by Charles Wesley. And this hymn is considered one of the best love of Wesley's 6,000 hymns. And it's called, And Can It Be? It's one of my favorites. And unlike the Jesuit, I can sing it with full gusto. I love this, this song. And can it be that I should gain an interest in the Savior's blood? Died he for me who caused his pain? For me who him to death pursued? Amazing love, how can it be that thou my God should die for me? He understood it. And then the refrain must be very irking to the Jesuits. Amazing love, how can it be that thou my God should die for me? The most beautiful Christian doctrine. Tis mystery all, the immortal dies. Who can explore his strange design? In vain the firstborn seraph tries to sound the depth of love divine. Tis mercy all, let earth adore. Let angel minds inquire no more. Amazing love, how can it be? that thou, my God, should die for me. He left his Father's throne above, so free, so infinite his grace, emptied himself of all but love, and bled for Adam's helpless race. Tis mercy all immense and free, for, O oh my God, it found out me. Isn't this beautiful? Beautiful. Amazing love, how can it be, that thou, my God, shouldst die for me. By removing the atonement, you remove the centrality of Christ and you put humanity in its place. You get there by your works, you pay your own price, even your forgiven sins you pay for in purgatory, and Jesus is removed out of the equation. Then what was his purpose? Nice example? Yes. That's all? That's all. Just a nice example? We must be careful that we make Jesus just our example. He is our example, yes, but he is much more than our example. He is our God. Our he king. is our King. He is our Savior. Amen. He is our atonement. He is the Lamb of God that taketh away the sins of the world. Anything less than that is paganism, is Babylonian religion. Can you see why we must flee out of Babylon? Long my imprisoned spirit lay, fast bound in sin and nature's night. Thine eye diffused the quickening ray, I woke the dungeon flamed with light. My chains fell off, my heart was free, I rose, went forth and followed thee. Amazing love, how can it be that thou, my God, shouldst die for me? And then this beautiful verse, no condemnation now I dread. Jesus and all in him is mine. Alive in him my living head and clothed in righteousness divine. Bold I approach the eternal throne and claim the crown through Christ my own. And then the verse, amazing love, how can it be that thou my God should die for me? Wesley understood the core of Christianity. A final thought, Sunday observance. This is the apostolic letter, Dies Domini, of the Holy Father, John Paul II, to the bishops and the clergy. When through the centuries she had made laws concerning Sunday rest. And remember, this is the very shrine that Donald Trump went to. Yes. And where they knelt at the shrine of John Paul II. Of John Paul II. When through the centuries she has made laws concerning Sunday rest, the church has had in mind above all the work of servants and workers. It's certainly not because this work was any less worthy when compared to the spiritual requirements of Sunday observance, but rather because it needed greater regulation to lighten its burden and thus enable everyone to keep the Lord's day holy. 
In this matter, my predecessor, Pope Leo, in his encyclical Rerum Novarum, spoke of Sunday rest as the workers' right which the state must guarantee. Therefore, also in the particular circumstances of our time, Christians will naturally strive to ensure that civil legislation respects their duty to keep Sunday holy. He wants church and state to be together. And isn't that what the Bible says will happen? Yep. And here's an interesting catechism. This is the catechism explained. Bellamine Forum. Now Bellamine is of course Cardinal Bellamine. Yes. And it's interesting that the Protestant world today believes Cardinal Bellamine's version of the Antichrist and uh, you know the future Antichrist that is to come. Yes. So, is that Babylonian or is that Biblical? No, it's Babylonian. Okay. Now, this, uh, the six commandments of Rome particularly pertain to the Sunday. So, they're rather interesting. The six precepts of the Church are an amplification of the third commandment of the Decalogue. Now, of course, actually that's the fourth commandment, yes. but because Rome removed the second commandment, they now only had nine commandments, so they divided the tenth one into two to get ten commandments, yes. but everything moved up one, so the third is really the fourth. So they don't work according to the Bible at all. They mm. work according to their tradition. Yes. The six precepts of the church on amplification of the third commandment, which is actually the fourth, so it's the Sabbath, Sabbath commandment. commandment. The first precept of the church enjoins upon the faithful to rest from work on certain days besides the Sunday to give thanks to God for special graces. The second precept of the church ordains the manner in which Sunday and other holy days of obligation are to be observed. And the third and fourth precepts of the church oblige us to confess and communicate at least once a year. The fifth precept bids us to support our pastors, and the sixth forbids us to marry non-Catholics or to solemnize marriage as forbidden times, at forbidden times. Okay, so they've got all kinds of rules which are not biblical. They're based on tradition. And the Bible says, in vain they worship me. For doctrines of men. Correct. Teaching their traditions as doctrine. So these are particular laws. It's interesting that on one of the conservative Catholic sites, they claim that even Donald Trump is not legally married to his wife because he's a Protestant. And unless he gets uh, that annulled and then marries again under Catholic conditions, then only will he be truly married in the eyes of the church. So that's an interesting point. So, number two, we are under a rigorous obligation to keep the commandments of the church. For their disobedience to the church is disobedience to Christ. But which Christ? Not the Christ of the Bible, because he told us to keep the seventh day, and they're telling us to keep the first day. Mm -hmm. So this must be the other Christ on earth, right? Christ has conferred upon the church the same powers which he himself received from his Father. He said to his apostles, as the Father has sent me, I send you. There's a difference between sending someone and obeying totally new precepts, right? Yes. He never said, as the Father sent me with laws and commandments to teach you, I send you to teach your own laws and commandments. He never said that, did no. he? No. So when the church enjoins anything upon us, it is the same as if Christ enjoined it, even if it's contrary to his word. Mm. For he said, whatsoever you shall bind upon earth shall be bound also in heaven. In disobeying the church, we disobey Christ. As he told the apostle, he that despises you despises me. The Lord speaks of the church as a kingdom. He also compares it to a fold to teach us that the children of the church must obey their ecclesiastical superiors. Every society is authorized to make laws which the members must observe. 
This the church does, and by her mouth God makes his will known to us. He therefore who wantonly violates one of the church's laws commits a grievous sin. It's interesting that the spirit of prophecy tells us, let no man tell you your duty. We can be in harmony around the scripture, but I may not be your conscience, and you may not be my conscience. My conscience must be dictated to by God. Yes. Three, the rulers of the church are empowered to dispense the faithful from observance of any of the commandments of the church for weighty reasons. That's very interesting. Does God say, uh, under certain circumstances, you don't have to keep my commandments? No. Has he never said that? No. Nowhere in the scripture, right? That no. Under, under circumstances, you're not, you don't have to keep the commandments. No. Certainly not. There's and nothing like that in the Bible. In fact, he said, those who love me keep my commandments. They keep my commandments, and I change not. I'm the Lord, I change not. But Rome says that they can set aside the commandments. The first commandment of the church, the observance of Sunday and holy days. That's the first commandment, the most important. Mm. In the first commandment of the church, the solemn observance of holy days is enjoined upon us. There are seven festivals of our Lord, five of Our Lady, and three of the saints. Very interesting. So, in Catholic Christian Instructed, we have this question. Has the Catholic Church power to make any alterations in the commandments of God? Answer. Instead of the seventh day and other festivals appointed by the old law, the Church has prescribed the Sunday and holy days to be set apart for God's worship. And these we are now obliged to keep in consequence of God's commandments instead of the ancient Sabbath. So who changed it? Roman Catholicism. By whose authority? The, ch the Church. Their own authority. Yes, their own authority. Now, here is a document from June the 17th. 2020. So this is very new. Yes. And it is Crisis Magazine, A Voice for the Faithful Catholic Laity. And it says, bring black back the blue laws. So in the United States on the seventh day of the week, trade and industry seem suspended throughout the nation. All noise ceases. A deep peace or rather a sort of solemn contemplation takes its place. The soul regains its own domain and devotes itself to meditation. Now, Alex de Tocqueville wrote these words in his 1835 masterpiece of political and social analysis, Democracy in America. So that's an old statement. And then uh, it talks about this beautiful piece that they had when they kept Sunday. We drop down, it says here, nevertheless, Americans in those early quarantine days, talking about COVID-19, after the haze of their Netflix binge had evaporated, woke up with a surprised appreciation for what earlier generations had considered normal. Mm -hmm. Sunday laws, mm -hmm. otherwise known as blue laws. As America returns to normality, we should consider these laws and their manifold benefit afresh. You should get them back. Mm -hmm. Acknowledging the rewards of the Sabbath are not limited only to Christians like Pope Francis, who in a 2018 interview declared, one day of the week, that's the least, out of gratitude to worship God, to spend time with family, to play, to do all those things. We are not machines. They then quote here, J. Lefkowitz, a lawyer, a Jewish lawyer, who said that the Jews also kept the Sabbath and it brings a healthy separation and balance between work and play and worship and all of these things. And then it refers back to that earlier quote and more seriously, this individual identified several benefits to the once common American inclination to rest. The first is how to worship how the worship of God orients man towards transcendent and its purposes. At church, the American hears of the need to control his desires, of the subtle pleasures of virtue alone, true happiness they bring, 
And then he sings a eulogy about how wonderful it was when they all kept the Sunday. The second benefit is the tempering quality of Sabbath observance on an American capitalism that can tend towards exclusively materialistic ends that obscure man's inherent dignity. This is talking like the papacy, where they want to control the economy and Sunday and is, is part of this. Laudato C is very plain on yes. this issue. The doctor then carries on and he perceived that democratic capitalism, if untethered from religion, would devolve into dehumanizing materialistic wasteland where men manipulate and exploit one another for profitable gain. So you have this whole social doctrine coming in there. Third, in directing citizens towards transcendent and Sabbath laws inspire men to pursue societal goods that will endure beyond their own circumscribed lives. In skeptical times, therefore, there is always the danger that men will surrender themselves endlessly to the casual whims of daily desire. So what we really need is this noble calm that comes upon us when we keep these days, where the soul finds momentarily voids of belief and the love of physical pleasure spreads to fill it entirely if you don't keep the Sabbath. Now with the few anomalous holdout Sundays are more or less indistinguishable from other days. Some counties still prohibit the sale of alcohol on Sunday. Some Florida counties prohibit the sale of sex toys on Sunday. Amongst other curiosities, horse racing and car dealerships are closed in Illinois. Many European nations never abandon Sunday trading restrictions. And their economies have managed just fine. So what are they suggesting? Sunday keeping, Sunday rest. America, for the sake of its own emotional and spiritual welfare, for the sake of your own sanity, needs to restore the blue laws. Is there a movement to get the Sunday back? 100%. They are talking about reset. We must make a WhatsApp about reset. Yes. They want to reset everything. They want to reset society. They want to reset the economy. They want to reset the industry. They want to reset the environment. They want it, to reset the social order. Everything has to be reset. Yeah, reset. A new world, a new post-corona world. Absolutely. And there will be a place for Sunday legislation in this. They are pushing it. And interesting. This talks against capitalism. So where you started in the previous uh, discussion that we had, this is clashing with Trump. We have this interesting clash. So now in contrast to what we've just read, Malachi 3 says, For I am the Lord, I change not. Therefore ye sons of Jacob are not consumed. The Lord does not change. His nature has not changed. And his law has not changed. Do not think that I have come to abolish the law, says Jesus. Mm -hmm. James 1.17, every good gift and every perfect gift is from above and cometh down from the Father of light, with whom is no variableness, neither shadow of turning. You cannot just change God's law. Remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. Six days shall you labor and do all your work. We know the Sabbath commandment. How long? For all eternity. I am the Lord. I change not. So he blessed the Sabbath day and he hallowed it. Deuteronomy says, And thou shalt remember all the ways which the Lord thy God led thee these forty years in the wilderness to humble thee and prove thee, to know what was in thine heart, whether thou wouldst keep his commandments or not. Nowhere is there permission to change God's commandments. Therefore thou shalt keep the commandments of the Lord thy God to walk in his way and to fear him. Beware that thou forget not the Lord thy God in not keeping his commandments and his judgments and statutes which I command thee this day. Whose authority? 
shall we acknowledge? God's authority. Is it a choice of worship? So if you choose to obey the papacy with regard to the Sunday rather than the Bible, then you are choosing the authority of another deity on this earth. The doctrine of the serpent. Correct. Deuteronomy 10, 13 says, To keep the commandments of the Lord and his statutes which I command you this day for thy good. Therefore thou shalt love the Lord thy God and keep his charge and his statutes and his judgments and his commandments always. Mm. God does not change. Therefore shall you keep the commandments which I command you this day that you be strong and go and possess the land whether you go to possess it. A blessing if you obey the commandments of God which I command you and a curse if you obey not the commandments of the Lord. I mean the Bible is very clear. Deuteronomy 26, 18, And the Lord has avouched thee this day to be a peculiar people, as he has promised thee, and that thou should keep all his commandments. He says in Deuteronomy 28, 13, And the Lord shall make thee the head and not the tail, and thou shalt be above only, and thou shalt not be beneath, if thou hearken unto the commandments of the Lord thy God, which I command thee this day, to observe and to do them. If Protestantism had kept the commandments, they would never have been sucked into the ecumenical movement to obey the precepts of the Pope. Yes, they wouldn't have begun, become part of Babylon. In Psalms 112 we read, Praise ye the Lord, blessed is the man that feareth the Lord, that delighteth greatly in his commandments. Then shall I not be ashamed, when I have respect unto all thy commandments, with my whole heart I have sought thee. Oh, let me not wander from thy commandments. I mean, the Bible is replete. Mm -hmm. John 14, if you love me, keep my commandments. 1421, he that has my commandments and keepeth them, he is the one that loveth me. 15 verse 10, if you keep my commandments, you abide in my love. I mean, Old Testament, New, New Testament. Testament. No difference. Paul actually says circumcision is nothing and uncircumcision is nothing but keeping the commandments of God. That's what's important, not the rituals and the other things. And hereby we know that we know him if we keep his commandments. It is so clear. And he that says I know him and keeps not his commandments is a liar. And they believe the doctrine of the serpent. By this we know that we love the children of God when we love God and keep his commandments. For this is the love of God, that we keep his commandments and his commandments are not grievous. I mean, I could carry on. Mm -hmm. Verse after verse, choose thee this day, says Joshua, whom you shall serve. Yeah, and Revelation also says, Revelation 22 verse 14, blessed are they that keep the commandments. That they may have access to the tree of life, exactly. right? So here's the bottom line. When we look at this issue of obedience to God, has God really said? And this issue of do we keep the precepts of God or do we keep the precepts of the world? Do we believe the serpent or do we believe God? That is the choice. Any organization that follows the lead of the beast becomes part of Babylon. And when Protestantism has given up the biblical precepts in favor of the Roman precepts, then it has fallen yes. and become part of Babylon. So that is why the message is repeated a second time. Babylon is fallen, fallen. is fallen, because there has been another component ad added. It was always the dragon, mm -hmm. it was always the beast, but unfortunately it is now also the false prophet. Come out of her, my people, that you be not partakers of her sins. And this is what the Bible teaches. And we have a choice. We can either follow the Bible and make that the rule of faith, or we can follow in the footsteps of the world and in the spiritual exercises and become swallowed up in spiritualistic teachings. As for me and my house, and I would invite you too, to follow the Lord, thus says the Lord. Will you pray for us? I will. 
Our Heavenly Father, thank you so much for giving us such clear um, teachings in your word. Help us to implement it in our lives and bless the people that watch this and also us and bring us again together. In Jesus' name, Amen. Amen. Thank you for watching this video. To subscribe, click here. When the bell appears, click again to get notifications. To watch the next video, click here. Thank you.